tati ga ana ki a mihi atu ki o tātou tini aitua ki ngā mate e takotoa ki nei rungu i ngā marae maha mai te rere ngā puta noa ki te motu, no rere i ngā mate haere, haere, haere. Haere hoki atu koutou ki te kainga tūturu mo tātou mo te tangata, takoto mai, takoto mai, takoto mai. A rātou ki a rātou, ko tātou ngā kano hi ora, ki ora mai tātou katoa. Um, <coughs> uh, it always amazes me the gracious introductions that we get um, when we come and speak at uh, Kaupapa like this. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, most people call me James. It depends which pub we met at. Some people call me Hemi. Some people call me things I can't talk about here. Um, no te iwi rangatira o Ngāpuhi. Uh, e te taha o tōku matua ko Ngāpuke hau a te maunga, ko Ngātoki mata whauru a te waka, ko hoki anga whakapau karaki a te moana, ko omanai a te kāinga, uh, ko papahuri hea te tupuna. Te taha o tōku māma, ko te ori o hina, te hapu, ko te rarawa te iwi, ko tu moana te tangata, ko tingana te waka. Rera i te iwi ko hau tēnā. Um, <clears throat> my first disclaimer is that I got kicked out of school at 14. I have no formal education <laughs> whatsoever. So um, at 15 I was in trade training. For the rest of my life I was doing laborious work uh, until I reached the ripe age of 23 when I was very fortunate to meet a kaumātua by the name of Sir Hector Busby. And uh, from that time, I spent nine years alongside our kaumātua. Um, he had a glorious time telling me what to do. <laughs> and in that time, we, um, we happily built 16 waka alongside each other. And they ranged from kōpapa, waka tiwai, uh, waka tete, waka tangata, waka taua, and um, our piste resistance, which Jack stole a few years ago, Ngahi Raka Mai Tawhiti, who, who has now uh, borrowed permanently, <laughs> which uh, has sailed, you know, um, uh, done a lot of sailing around the motu, as well as uh, uh, through the Pacific to Rapa Nui and back. Uh, so that's who I am, Fanu. Um I jokingly said to Jack um, a couple of weeks ago because he asked me, have you got anything ready or paper ready for this thing? And I was like, paper? And I said, what I might do is throw a, throw a picture of a tree up and just talk to the tree. But I haven't even prepared a tree for everyone to look at. <laughs> so I'll pretend to be the tree. Um, it's difficult to talk about uh, my field of expertise, if you like, because there's so... There's, there are no textbooks for Tarai Waka. There's nothing, I mean, there, there are uh, ethnographic, you know, documents which went through and documented certain things, but there's no textbooks and there's no rule book around um, building a waka other than the experiences that we've had over the last um, oh, accumulated 40 to 50 years between Hector and myself um, and others, sorry. Uh, we're not the only ones. Um, so, my whakaro this morning, because I think Jack wants me to talk really quick because he's got a lot to talk about, was to more or less open the floor for an open discussion, question and answer time around what tarai waka is, what, what canoe building is, because I think that would add more value to the wānanga and probably draw out more things than I will just talk about naturally. So, um, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Kippa, um, Kippa and I hauled out a canoe from, or should I say where the forest is? <laughs> <coughs> from a forest somewhere up here in the north. <laughs> um, uh, a little while ago, um, and to the best of our knowledge, is the first waka that has been shaped in the forest uh, in the last 80 years. Um, the, the, the only other one we know of in that, in that period is Ngātoki Matawhaurua sitting down in Te Korowai. So I just want to acknowledge Kippa um, and the strength of our teams to actually get through that mahi. Uh, nō reira, I'm just going to open the floor and see if there are any questions for anyone to ask about the mahi itself. Nice. <laughs> Oh, 
Kia ora. Oh, can, you, can everyone hear me all right or do I need the mic? Yeah. Te so, um, what's involved in choosing the tree? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, Dex just said the, the very the most important one, how close it is to the road. <laughs> <clears throat> that, that's a really important one. No, it is, it is. Um, uh, you know, Hector always used to say to us, you know, you know you've got it when you can see the canoe in the tree while the tree is standing. So when we go um, and look at Rako, uh, that's actually what I'm looking for. I'm trying to see the line of the waka in the Rako as it's standing. Um, basically, you're looking for a nice straight tree and as big as you can get it. They, they, those are my prerequisites for, for finding that arco. But there's also instances where you have to consider where it's grown. So ridgeline rako are often better than rako that have grown down in, in valleys. And that's only because they get beaten from a windward side and the density of the timber gets thrown out to what you would use as the bottom of the waka. And if you're getting it from inside the valleys, uh, they don't have such an even beaten side and you end up with these, um, and especially in Cody, you have these sap lines running down the tree that are really uneven and it's really hard to guess where the line of the canoe can be. Yeah. And other than that, sometimes we go and talk to the trees, but I don't want to get too deep into the, <laughs> the sort of eccentric stuff we might get up to. There's a papa between um, Cody and... Tohora? Wales? Yep, yep. correct. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I believe the story goes a little bit like, um, you know, and it's one of those creation stories that uh, Cody and um, Tohora uh, were kind of figuring out whether they would, one would live inland or one would live out on the ocean. And they were both kind of, there was a debate about it. And then, um, oh, kapai. Oh, kapai. Tēnā koe. And I'm saying this not in the not in depth in the world yeah. also because English can't really articulate our stories properly. Mm -hmm. Or at all, you know, to the depth and true essence of the um, But um, so the Tohora I went out to explore the ocean and just absolutely loved it. So he went back on to land to his brother, the Kobe, um, and and shared the story and explained how amazing it was and that he should go up to the Moana um, and live there because Tonga just had decided he was going to live up um, in, in the ocean. And uh, Cody said, Carl, how to work it for me. That made him care for me. Guru hit it to Kiri. And he said, okay, well, then I'm going to give you my skin because he was going to come to him and it should be going to the sea. So he gifted his skin to the Cody, um, and that's the connection there. And it's actually scientifically proven um, the bark of the Cody and the whale skin was actually connected. That's a true proof. Kia ora. And it's just, another, um, it's just another way of showing how Western science is actually catching up to our, to our truth. <laughs> See, I, I knew all of that, but like here, I wasn't going to give it all away. Kia ora, Nani.
Um, kia ora, kia ora, that's a good question. Um, there's an old hoiwaka paddling chant. It goes, Ko tōtara haere kauai, ko rimu haere kauai, ko pukatea haere kauai, ko kahikatea haere kauai, ko tāne haere kauai. And within that, within that um, kōrero are all the prized waka tree. So those are the, those are the rako that we aim for. Um, in recent times, because of resource, because Cody and everything is getting so scarce, uh, we, we've turned to using exotic rako, like, uh, like poplar, uh, like macrocarpa, like pine, uh, a lot of the exotic trees where we've figured out that actually we don't need to go and take our native resource all the time, we can actually still keep the skill alive. Uh, using using some of our exotic rakau. But in terms of the native timbers, those are the ones that we use. Uh, the less dense timbers are usually used on the top sides for carvings because they add less weight to the top side and make the waka le less tippy. Um, and the denser timbers are usually used for the hulls, particularly the kauri and the totara. Yeah. And if anyone asks why we use the exotics, what, how, we, how we think that, you know, in the Māori philosophy, all of the rakau belong to Tāni anyway, so whether it's come from Germany or wherever, for us it's, you know, tamariki a tāni, yeah. Plus they're really easy, they're really close to the road. <laughs> You're not. I don't have a question, I, I have a begging request. I'm helping to manage the proceedings. We want to have the best questions and the best answers in the proceedings. We don't have a recording without the mic. Ah. So, so please ask for the mic, please use it. Thanks, sir. You're done. Does anyone want the mic? <laughs> I'm using the mic. I think I've got this one. Oh, yeah, that one's here. Uh, Diana, or shall we now move on? Mike? Could you talk just a little bit about your experiences of Tarai Waka with your Fanonga in the Pacific and what is happening later this year in relationship to that? Mm. That's a half hour. Uh, I, I should probably start with saying that Tarai Waka itself is an at-risk art form. And in fact, last year it was ramped up to a priority art form uh, because there are so few practitioners, not just in Aotearoa, but throughout the Pacific. Um, the people that I know from Hawaii down through the Polynesian Triangle anyway, you know, I can, I can count the master practitioners on one hand. And that's the reality. You know, we, we're the dying breed. Um, the navigators get a good one, but you know. Uh, for some reason, people forget about the guy who actually built the canoe. That's, that I'm just kind of, did, did, you, did you see that? That was pretty good, I thought. Um, I, I don't know what it is about canoe covers, but we seem to be cut from the same, we, we're chips from the same tree, you know, we, we, we have this real deep passion, not just for the art form, but we have a real passion for our people, and um, I know myself and uh, some of the other teachers, we, we really put our heart and soul into our students, you know. Um, sometimes we're disappointed by that, sometimes we might just get one little pearl come out and they, you know, they really do get that same passion and stuff, but <clears throat> yeah, for starters, you're, you're a special sort of person that, um, you know, has to, has to be committed to the art form and, and committed to your people. So that group of carvers around the Pacific are all like that. Um, So in October we have two of those carvers coming down from Tahiti and Hawaii and we'll be carving alongside each other to sort of revitalise something that um, Heck and I and others were involved in in Hawaii, which was the Festival of Canoes. And there those, those um, practitioners would meet every year and we would carve canoes over the period of two weeks 
but it was something that we we thrived off each other's energy. Um, we learnt from each other. We learnt a hell of a lot from each other. Um, and I, I suppose in terms of my role, I'm asking myself the question is, how do I keep it alive? Or, you know, at times I'm even asking, is it worth keeping alive? So, <laughs> did you see that? <laughs> um, those are serious questions for me, though. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's the umbrella of what we call kaupapa waka, and within that there's, there's three core parts for me. One is whakatere waka, which is all the voyaging and sailing, um, navigation, that, that comes into that column. The other column is uh, kaihoi waka, which is waka ama, you know, waka tangata, our paddlers, that's that component. You could, you could say that those two components are thriving right now, you know, due to the work of people like Jack, uh, like Sir Hector, um, you know, uh, a whole lot of other people who have made those two columns thrive and are stronger now than they ever were. But if you look at the Tarai Waka column, I mean, um, honestly, how many canoe builders do you know? How many can you talk about and how many do you even recognise? You know? So we're, we're, the, we're, we're, oh, I just realised I'm an endangered species, <laughs> <coughs> which is kind of cool. Yeah, Andrew, you'll have to put a GPS tracker on me and track my movements. Um, you know, I mean, there are very few practitioners. I've done a fair bit of work over the last six years to um, help some of our young people gain at least the mechanical skill. Um, <coughs> but you can't, teach pa you can't teach passion and commitment. You can't teach it. So, but you can teach the mechanical skill. And what I'm hoping is that in time, some of my students will actually um, pick up the passion and the commitment to it. Yeah. Well, I'm not, that's, did that answer your question, Kate? Uh, Kia ora, Martin. Uh, I'm just listening to you talk about being an endangered species. <laughs> and I know we, 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 we laughed and we joked. But the fact of the matter is really quite serious. Mm. And it's so serious that my question is, why isn't there a program in place to support you to really, really continue this art. Because once gone, gone forever. Yeah. Clearly. Kia ora. Kia ora. Can we work with MFAT on that? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Kia ora. Um, we, we currently run a training program and um, Hector and Jacko and others were running programs for a number of years, eh, Jack? Like, I mean, I came around in 2002 for the very first Wananga for Rapa Nui and, um, you, know, uh, you know, how I got committed to it was uh, Hector at the time had just pulled the logs out from Ngahiraka Mai Tawhiti. I came along and said, oh, you know what, Matu, I'll commit to being here with you and helping you uh, for as long as it takes to build the waka. He told me it would take six months. You know, six years later, I was going, we're still not finished, Chief. <laughs> um, so there, there, have been, there have been attempts, but it's, it's, it's trying to, I suppose, um, it's the delivery of the skill, it's how we deliver it, um, and it's getting it to a point of critical mass where uh, others like myself can walk away and just say, OK, we've done our part the matauranga's out there and just let it go. Resource is another big concern because our rākau are pretty scarce, so, yeah, it's, it's a real, it's a balancing act, yeah. Aye, he kōrero, aye. Pātai pai, pātai pai, um, is Walter here? Oh, Walter is here. <laughs> Short answer, yes. 
ko tae te wahine te tāra i te waka. Te tāra i te waka. Ko te whakairo anō te whakairo. I tika ngā anō tō te whakairo. Engari ko te tāra i te waka, ka tae te wahine te tāra i. Yeah. Um, I actually have uh, a young wahine with me at the moment who's, who's one of my students. Um, she's still on trial. And her, her, her iwi tono is sitting over there. <laughs> Um, that that was a great challenge for me because she is the first in Aotearoa who has actually taken up that challenge. Um, and when it was first put to me, I, I, in my mind I just can't figure out why we have this perception that wahine can't work alongside us on waka. And we're one of the only countries uh, in the world where we say, oh, you know, that can't happen. Or people have this perception that it can't happen. So if you go to Rarotonga and you sit with Mike Tawioni, it's his wife, Afitia, who does most of the work on the canoe, you know. While Mike's smoking and reading poetry to all the manuhiri, you know, Afitia is the one hitting the toki and, and carving the canoe. You know, they work alongside each other and they love what they do and they are masters at it. Um, same thing in Hawaii. Our Hawaiian wahine are some of the best canoe builders, uh, you know, in the world. Um, and I, you could, there are examples all around the Pacific of where our wahine are right alongside us. So when I took hine on, which is, which is our tawira at the moment, um, I had a lot of kickback from what you might call traditionalists. So I had to back myself up with, with tradition and ask and challenge them as to why she can't be here. You know, in the end, I won anyway because no one, because I'm an endangered species. I was, where's Manuka? I was able to be really sincere, <coughs> and 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 basically no one could challenge my position on it. You know, and what I did though was I reiterated the story of our tupuna Mahurangi at the felling of the tree uh, for Mahuhu Kitarangi and Tainui um, back in the islands, and it was uh, it's it's a it's a beautiful story because none of the none of the tāne could actually make the rako move when they went to haul the rako from the forest, and it was Mahurangi, the the, <coughs> the wahine who was there, who actually did what uh, what's called te taki a manu. You know, she said ko hau ki te tumu o te rako ki te taki ngā manu o te rangi. So she 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 told all the men. You fellas go over there and haul on those ropes, I'm going to stand on the tree stump and tell you what to do. And it was her karakia that actually made the rako move. And so if, 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 we're, if our wahina are with us right at the beginning, why aren't they there right through the whole process? That was my challenge to others. Because as far as I know, and Hector was the same, he had wahine with us from time to time. Um... I don't know why they can't do it, and I don't know why there's a perception that they can't. There's one rule, and I stick to it because Hector stuck to it. If it's waka taua, then I, uh, then I will ask our wahine to, to be respectful of that space. Yeah. And I, I, and I ask them to try and understand that actually it's about their mana. It's not about, you know, uh, putting barriers around them. It's about them understanding the true power of their mana. Yeah. So, koya tēnā whā, the short answer, yes. Yes, they can, they can build waka with us. Kia <coughs> 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 I knew Jack when I was at Hapo Pepper, of course, he's a bit older than me, but uh, anyway, I'll hang up Jack. <laughs> Swap seats, bro. Kia ora, Bobby. You want to swap? <laughs> Whilst he's doing that, I'll do the uh, other bits. Oh, that was fast. Hi, kia ora no tātou. Uh, I tēnā waka tuake nei ki te mihi, uh, e mihi ana ki uh, ngā rangatira kua tuwherahi o te wā mō tātou, uh, ki te whakaputa mā kōrero e pāna ki ngā take kai mui a tātou, uh, tēnei he take nunui ki a māua nei e pāna ki tō tātou nei, ki tō tāua nei waka 
ngahi raka mai tawhiti a me tērā waka tuatahi a te aurere. Hei, hei tēnei e mi atu uh, ki a koutou koe ke mai nei, a i runga i tēnei huarahi uh, ki tō tātou nei taha. Nā reira, uh, tēnā rau atu ki a tātou. Um, <coughs> Ko maua o te maunga, ko tauranga te mōna, uh, ko ngai te rangi, ngāti rangi nui, ngāti pūkenga, me wai tā kumara māua aku nei iwi. Uh, ko tiaki, wepiha, te kāpene, tetra, tōku ingoa. But you can call me Jack, because <coughs> that's what everybody else calls me. The other name, I was actually named after my grandfather and my great-grandfather. Uh, my grandfather's name was Tiaki Wepiha Bruit. He had uh, English, French uh, ancestry, his, and his father was a guy called Robert Albert Blewett, and he was a uh, descendant of a barony in, uh, in England uh, of Norman descent. So that French, that French side is there as well. And um, the reason I say that was he was a captain in the British Army, so I hold his title. Uh, Te Kāpene basically is for that. Everybody thinks it's for the other thing, but, you know, that I've been doing... I know, for a while now. <clears throat> um, I don't know why I brought that out, because it takes too long to explain, but, uh, and I did ask James for more time, but he's got, given me basically nothing. <clears throat> um, well, uh, I was here to talk about, um, about uh, traditional navigation, I suppose, but um, I'm probably going to do a little bit of that, but um, what I really want to do is uh, talk a little bit, in the first instance, about our tūpuna and how they got to the places where they went. Sorry, I, my computer turned itself off. So, unfortunately, aroha mai matua manuka, but um, I totally disagree with one comment you made in regards to there being possibly major losses of our tūpuna when they uh, voyaged to Aotearoa. I don't believe that. And the reason I don't believe that is because of my own experiences. And my own experiences are happening at a time when the environment is changing a lot more rapidly than it was in their time. It's way more dangerous to sail today, I believe, than it would have been for our tūpuna. There's less fish in the ocean now, overfishing. There's increased period of time when cyclones affect the ocean. When I first started, I got told the cyclone season starts in the South Pacific in November and goes till March, and then it's over. The last 10 years, I've been studying this for a long, long time. The last 10 years, it starts in October and goes all the way through to May. This is in the last 10 years that I've been noticing the changes. So these are, these are you know, some of the things that are concerning us as voyagers because it gives us less time to be able to be out uh, doing what we, what we pretty much enjoy doing. Uh, going out and, for one part, being 80% of the time bored spitless, 15% of the time having a good time, 4.5% of the time that good time is exhilarating, and half a percent of that time is totally terrifying. <clears throat> you know, if you, can, if, you can, if you can go out there and do that, then, uh, you know, voyaging is a great career. It doesn't pay you anything, <laughs> but it does give you a hell of a lot of, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, exposure out to, uh, to where we come from and the adulation that comes with that from our tuakana when we arrive on their shores is something uh, to be experienced. The, uh, they, hold, they uphold us in such a high regard. It's, uh, it's actually quite embarrassing. And uh, I just want to mihi to to Taku Hone uh, Ani Black. Uh, she's one of our wahine uh, kaumuana. Uh, she voyaged with me to Rapa Nui and back. And uh, and I can honestly say, in the middle of the storm, I had to growl her because she was standing right up at the at the bow where most of the wave and wind was, and uh, and was singing a, a, to the storm. And I had I went out there and went Ani. I did not say exactly what I said. <laughs> Get back underneath the tent you know, because we had a little, little cover. And she goes, oh, why? I'm enjoying it. Man, that's our wahine toa. <laughs> Aye, and uh, before somebody asked me a question about do we have wahine on board, of course we do. And so did our tūpuna. Somebody mentioned the fact about kupia. Sorry, I, I always forget to turn on the damn things and it's gone off again. 
I didn't mind that. We won't, we won't bother with that. Um, <laughs> kupe. Somebody mentioned kupe and kura marotini. And uh, I've, I've got a little theory about kura marotini. Because uh, I, I heard two stories about uh, the arrival of kupe in Aotearoa. The first one was uh, that uh, he went off and, uh, and he saw this beautiful woman and he wanted her. Uh, this is my uncle teaching me the story, by the way. And so he went over and, uh, and his cousin was married to her. So he took his cousin out, I forget his name, out onto a reef to go diving. Oh no, sorry, to go fishing. And they were fishing and they couldn't put, and he'd done it so he couldn't pull, he pull up the anchor. So he got him to dive down and, and release the anchor. And when he went down and did that, he pulled it up quickly and took off and left him there. And uh, he went back to the island and he went to Kura Marotini and said, oh, your husband drowned, you better come with me. He jumped on board and took off. <clears throat> so he stole his, uh, uh, his, uh, his wife to be, Kura Marotini. And then they eventually arrived down in Aotearoa and she yells out, Hell, 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 Aotearoa! <coughs> Do I need a microphone for that? <laughs> hell, yeah, exactly. So she's the one that saw the land. I'm getting to the point here. The point is, and it's exactly the same point that, uh, that James brought up in terms of wahine being able to, uh, to tarai waka. We talk about, about tohunga tanga and uh, who are those people that are able to hold the knowledge. And for some reason, it always seems to be men at the top of that list. No, always does. However, my theory is, is there are two stories. The other one was about the feke. And he chased the feke, and it was Hine Taaparangi that saw the island and saw the clouds and named us Aotearoa. You know, when you have a kōrero that doubles up on itself, you start to think there's something more to that kōrero, something really important that we're missing. It's not kupe that says, heo, heo, heo Aotearoa. It's his wife. I think, I, I believe that Hine Taaparangi is a title that was given to Kura Marotini as an, uh, uh, in likeness of an upper kura, one of the marae kura, you know, those guardians of the heavens, and that it was her job to guide the waka to find the land. That's really controversial in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, this male-dominated thing that we, we seem to have these days about the ability of only men to be tohunga. There's another kōrero. I just want to bring these out about... Uh, about the Taki Tumuwaka. My uncle, I'm from Taki Tumuwaka. And he says, Taki Tumuwaka was a waka of Tohunga. And they brought ritual to Aotearoa. This is our kōrero on Tauranga Muna. So there were no women on board. And I went, Phew. okay, uncle. So they brought ritual down here. Who brought the ritual of Te Whare Tangata? Hey, ask yourself that question. Who brought that? Who could teach their, their, uh, their mokopuna, their kōtiro, all of those things that they need to talk about their mate, about childbirth, about all those things. So tohunga tanga, I believe, doesn't just belong in the hands of men, but they belong in the hands of those that have knowledge of what's required for good civilization. And, you know, uh, I'm lauded for being a master navigator. I only became a master navigator in 2010 when my master died, Mo Pialuk. And that was, that was his... His gift to me was the protection of his school. In 2008, when I went to uh, Satawal in Micronesia, and he said, he said to me, he whispered in my ears on the last day of, uh, of, um, of the ceremonies, when four, four days of ceremonies, he compacted 18 days into four because he believed we didn't need the other 14 days because we were already voyaging, we were already pulling islands out of the ocean, and we were already doing those things and experiencing all those things that a poor navigator should. And he placed a little piece of paw. Paw is uh, coral, white coral. And they use that to shape it into a pounding stone that pounds the turtle, that pounds the, the breadfruit. And when we were there, they pounded the, the breadfruit and they pounded the turtle and they made food of the gods. They did that on the first day. On the last day, we ate it. Four days of sitting out in hot sun it was beautiful. <laughs> Honestly, cooked. <clears throat> uh, oh, sorry, I lost my place. Where was I? Oh, yeah, so pounding. So the poor stone uh, that pounds the turtle, being a poor navigator is somebody that has been pounded by his experiences 
into somebody who can teach. His other thing that he said to me was, we know magic. We know magic. I don't think he was, he was actually saying that we can have sparks flying out of our fingers and doing all those things. What he was saying was that we know things that other people don't know. And they believe that we're doing magic. So we do magic. <coughs> and, you know, and some of the things that, that, um, that we've been involved in over the years would seem to be by some people quite miraculous. Uh, I've been in a cyclone. That wasn't very nice. Uh, I've been in a couple of storms with, uh, with Annie. Yeah, that was okay. She, she was happy. <coughs> you know, it's the reaction that we have when we're, when we're doing something that we, we love doing. At the start, it can be quite frightening. But as you do it more and more and become more expert at it, you have more experience, then, you know, you, you begin, well, I began to enjoy it as soon as I came out of my first storm. And, uh, and it's actually the, uh, the leadership of the people around you that's the important thing in those experiences. Because if you have somebody that's fearful who's supposed to be the guy that's looking after you, then you're not going to feel very, well, very good. In my first storm, I was, I was going to say something that I'm not allowed to say, but I was scared very much. <laughs> uh, big waves, waka almost capsized, and, uh, and I was trembling around on my hands and knees, and actually I was actually terrified. And what I did was I looked up, and I looked into the eyes of a tiny wee little man called Mo Pierce Mo Pialuk. And he had these calm, calm eyes. They're a little bloodshot, but <laughs> we've all got those. <laughs> and I looked into his eyes, and all I saw was this calm, you know, and then he poured a little drink of raki, uh, raki which is uh, <coughs> Taitukuro moonshine. <laughs> Actually, it's a Delhi moonshine, but, you know, <coughs> comes from the same place. And... Um, and he offered it to me. Anyway, it, uh, so I gave it and I took it and I had a warm feeling in my stomach and had a warm feeling sitting next to him and had a warm feeling with my mate, uh, Clay Bertelman, who was a Hawaiian voyager who came down to sail with us on our first voyage to Rarotunga. That was uh, eye-opening. So when we went to Rapa Nui, um, except for the part where I was angry with everyone all the time, most of the time, uh, I tried to exude a, a feeling of calm. Unfortunately, I'm one of these guys that can't sit down for very long, and um, <laughs> I was calm, I will say. But uh, at one point in the storm, uh, we had one of our wahine crew members, and uh, she looked at me like she was in that period of, of being very terrified. And I remember I, I came out of the, I came out of uh, uh, out of our hut, opened the door, looked up, there she was, she's huddling down like this, and I I uh, I sort of winked at her and smiled. And uh, she told me afterwards, that's the only thing got her through the storm. You know, so people, people react uh, um, in, in ways that are more positive when I suppose your leadership is not showing the signs of the fear that you're showing. You know, I wasn't actually entirely, you know, non-fearful. But, you know, those things you can't, you can't afford to, uh, to, um, uh, to be, you know, that person that's going to... Uh, I suppose, make other people fearful, especially when it's your job to protect. So, back to Pierce Mo Piola, putting the poor stone on my hands, what he whispered in my ears were, were, you are the light. You are responsible for preserving life. On his island, that's very, very important. It's his job to go find the turtle. It's his job to go find the fishing grounds. It's his job, I suppose, to preserve the life of his people on his island because they depend on him for that. When we, were there, when we went there in 2008, they, they were resorting to aid ships to bring them food because his people were leaving the islands and going to Guam, going to the Hawaii, going to the States for education. So the young people weren't taking on the challenges uh, of... I suppose the, the life-preserving uh, 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 roles that they had to pay, play in going out fishing, learning how to sail their waka. They needed fuel for their motors. 
they didn't know how to sail their waka. We arrived there on, a, on, a, on, our, on the ship and we were bringing aid to them. We brought them things like uh, rice, water, all sorts of foodstuffs, smokes, burgundy, whiskey. <laughs> no, yeah, those are all part of the ritual. But, um, you know, uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is that, uh, that uh, and this is what I was saying to Hemi, I, I wanted to sort of talk to you about what, what does it mean to be a poor navigator? Because I still don't really know. I don't know. I don't know what my role is in preserving life. I don't know what my role is in being the light. I think that role is, uh, uh, I, I think I, I played that role in winking at my crew member and smiling in the storm. And, uh, and I, I believe that it's my role to be more involved with uh, issues around, uh, I suppose, the, the plight of our oceans. Because that's, a, that's, a, that's something that we, uh, we really need to be thinking about. I know this, you're all expecting me to talk about navigation, but that's really boring <laughs> for me because <laughs> I do it all the time. But, uh, you know, I, I really want to really emphasize a, a point uh, in terms of that, uh, uh, that, that preserving life because the ocean is what preserves life. The ocean is what provides for, you know, almost 100% of, uh, of people living on the planet, except for those ones that may be in the middle of some desert somewhere, they, they, they need the ocean to provide their sustenance. And what we're doing and what we see when we're out there is the abuse that goes on by what I like to call um, virus humanity. Um, because what we're doing is we're putting plastics into the ocean, we're putting rubbish into the ocean, and because it all sinks down to the bottom and there's a nice calm flat look, you know, that might be a whakapapa pounamu to us when we're looking at it. The reality is it's paru as below. And uh, tuia, you know, I've got to do the tuia thing because that's my job. Tuia is, uh, is, is, uh, is a way for us uh, for Hotu and I, Hotu Ruaku and I, we took a we took a, a risky step in being involved in Tuya, and uh, and I don't regret it. We took a risk though in uh, in doing that because of all the angst against Captain Cook. To me, I don't really care about him. What I care about is the opportunity for us to be able to share our stories with the world to bring our miharotanga into the histories where they should be uh, because most of New Zealand don't know about the wonderful things that our tūpuna achieved. And uh, the reason why I say I, I disagree with, uh, with, uh, with there must have been uh, huge losses is because I was brought up in the bush by my dad. He was a bushman. I learn how to, I learn how to scrub cut. I learn how to plant trees. I learn how to do all that stuff. I go into the bush, find my way, and come out again. I did that from a young age, you know, right up until I uh, I jumped on a waka. I actually went into the army because I thought I had to live up to my name. 1991, oh, 1983, I was commissioned, Royal New Zealand Infantry, and 1991 I made captain. So hey, I lived up to my name. Uh, but, you know, the reality of, of that is, was unfulfilling. The fulfilling part has happened since then. And uh, a lot of people ask me, how did, you, how did you manage to do all the stuff that you've done when Mo Piolog was five years old when he learned, when he started learning to become a poor? He was five years old, he learned all the karakia. Uh, and then by 18, he graduated at the lowest level of poor and he was allowed to marry. He's got 23 children. Not much else to do on the island. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> oh, sorry, I just shouldn't have said that. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so for him, when he shared with us, it was because his own sons didn't want, they didn't want the hardship that goes with being responsible. They wanted to, learn, uh, to live these wonderful lives in America and they did that. They went to university, did all those things. 
uh, except for his younger son. His younger son learned alongside us, and he was happy that that happened. So, you know, I'm trying to paint a really weird sort of picture here, but um, the thing about it is, is that what he instilled in us was our desire not just to be, well, it was a desire to be great voyagers. We all want to be navigators. Then all of a sudden he goes, you are responsible for preservation of life. And I go, shit, what's that? <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that because that's how I felt. Uh, you know, and uh, how do I preserve life the way you do? I go to, I go to pack and save. Uh, <laughs> so getting to the point, the point is that through Tuya, we hope to make a difference in that way as well because we've been bringing our voyages together and we've been talking about how do we affect change in the attitudes of humanity to our oceans? And we do that, we do that by being the right role model for that. So what we're doing is we're putting together a, uh, a declaration uh, that recognises that uh, Te Mona Nui Akiwa uh, is an entity. Whether we look at that entity as being Tangaroa, or whether we look at that entity as being Wainui, whatever. It's an entity that has rights, but has no ability to voice those rights. And so our job is to be that voice. And that's what we want, uh, want to achieve with the declaration. And we're going to bring that declaration to you through Tuya to start with. And then next year, we're going to carry that declaration uh, through the Central Pacific at the moment. I had hoped to carry it up to Hawaii, but nobody will fund us. <clears throat> you can dig deep if you like, but I don't think you'll give us enough. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, and um, not, to, not to sound like I'm preaching or anything, which, which is probably what I have been doing, um, but it's, a, uh, it's something that we all need to be thinking about. Uh, because if we think about, about uh, the world and where it's at today, um, I've been talking to some scientists, guys, and uh, I actually said to them at this uh, big hui that we had up in Hawaii, you guys are depressed. Uh, you guys seem depressed to me because they're talking about ocean acidification, they're talking about plastics in the ocean, they're talking about extinction event coming soon. And I went, Phew. you should come down and spend a bit more time with us. The thing about indigenous people is, is that we have a lot more faith than you do because <coughs> Basically, we don't look at the figures. We just go out there and say, there's some rubbish, let's clean it. How are we going to do that? So we've got to affect that by, I suppose, doing something about it. And I've got five minutes left. Oh, my. Um, Can you talk about Mangari Vatsarapanui and the tohu and the navigation stuff from that league? Because that's sort of quite spiritual. Mangari River. Okay. Manga, oh, oh, sorry, yes. Uh, no, actually, actually, um, one, one, uh, not that one. I'm going to do the one from... Uh, we, we, when we were sailing to, uh, on our, our, our voyage to Rapa Nui, it took us 43 days to go from Aotearoa to Tubuai. Should have only taken us 20-something. I told all these guys, ah, oh, we're going to be out there like three weeks. We're out there six. And they thought, oh, he's dud. <laughs> and they, they weren't wrong, but... Uh, I mean, they weren't right. One of those. Anyway, we were, on the way there, we, uh, you know, we went through quite a lot of hardship. We had four storms, four storms, and then when we started to head up towards uh, Tubuai, uh, things sort of changed. We're heading up into a warmer climate because uh, we stayed down in the Southern Ocean for a long time. That's why we got pounded. And we're heading up, and then we started seeing tohu. We saw things like the tohora, uh, and uh, that was mentioned earlier, the tohora sailing, Ah, sorry, um, swimming, and uh, and one even came up straight in front of us. We would have hit it if we hadn't turned off. And he, I remember uh, saying to um, Regan, I think it was, Regan says to me, do I turn up? And I said, what do you think? <laughs> and so he comes over and he turns up and we miss the whale. So I jump up and the whale turns over and he's got an eye about that big. I tell you, that's my phone ringing. <laughs> It's got an eye about this big. I try and ignore it. He's got an eye about this big. And you look into that and it's like looking into a window of, into the past. Yeah, that's, what, that's how I felt. 
because you look into that eye and it's just like depthless. Uh, you know, it's just, I don't know, it was something really, really that, uh, that um, uh, had, a, had a huge effect on me. Now, the reason I brought up that whale is because a lot of people, you know, they're saying to us, why, why are we doing these things? I says, because we see things that tell us that we have to do something. The whale coming up then and, and, and looking at me, and I'm getting this feeling from it. You know, I didn't know what that feeling was at the time, but I, I put that, I've, 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 I've used that particular instance as a, as a, 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 for myself to actually, uh, I suppose, consolidate my concern. And so now I'm constantly at home thinking about, about the environment and I write lots of submissions against things that are happening that I don't feel are right. So, you know, that, that work is, uh, is sort of being guided, I think, by those things that we see. Another, another instance um, is, is the fact that I had the privilege of sailing on Wakatapu uh, with uh, some, some wonderful women, some strong ladies that uh, sailed with us. And when we left Aotearoa, there were six men, four women. When we left, uh, when we left Tubuai to sail to a place called Mangareva, there were four men and five women. And when we left from Mangareva to sail to Rapa Nui, uh, it was five and five. And uh, the reason I bring that up, and I've gone over my five minutes, I think, is that, um, is that we need that balance. We need that balance. And that's why I believe that our tupuna uh, did the same things. And there was a question in regards to when our tupuna left the islands, why did they leave? I tell you, in the first instance, nobody ever says they went exploring. It's always they left because of war. They left because of overpopulation. Nobody ever says they went exploring first. Because the, if you understand the full expansion of humanity across the planet, they went exploring first. So when they're standing in Southeast Asia, looking out in this huge island, uh, ocean, they're going, wonder what's out there. We know that there's an island over there. Let's go have a look, see what's past that. And keep going, keep going, keep going. Basically, uh, those islands were really close together. Then they get to a small place where there's a little bit more distance. And they invent an ama. They stick a couple of dugouts together, you know, they chuck their raft away and they either pole or they paddle across. Then they get to another space where, oh look, there's nothing there now, wonder what's over that horizon. They jump on, build a sail, put that on and shh, out there. And they're going from west, Southeast Asia to east, that's going into prevailing conditions in, central, in the Central Pacific. Right? That was the purpose of our voyage to Rapa Nui. Because uh, we, were, we were wanting to get there to close the triangle, so Hector says. <coughs> My purpose was, was really to see if we could go from the western end of, uh, of the ocean to the eastern end in a more direct route. Everybody else was sailing around the big loop. So we went from Aotearoa up to, up to Tubuai. We went from Tubuai to Mangareva. I wish I'd turned that on because I'll show you what, what it looks like. And then we went from Manga River almost direct. I thought we might be going like this. Up and down, up and down, zigzagging, take, you know, another 40 days from Manga River to, to Rapa Nui. Because when we came into, into Manga River, we had 25 knots on the wind. Ah, sorry, 25 knot winds on the nose. And we were 30 miles away from the island and it took us four days to get there. <laughs> if you're going to Rapa Nui, that's exactly the same direction. And if there's 25 knots winds had stayed there, we'd be still out there zigzagging backwards and forwards, you know, seven years later. And, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow down and finish now. <laughs> but, uh, what, what I'm trying to say is really is that, um, you know, uh, we've gone from a transition of, first it was, it was about following our ancestral pathways with Hokulea. They wanted to sail from Hawaii to, to Tahiti, Prove that it could be done. They did that. Then it was about learning the navigation and being able to do that. Nainoa did that. Nainoa Thompson, he did that in 1980. Then it was about sharing that with other 
with our other Polynesian whanau. Nainoa did that too, and he shared it with us. Then it was about training new navigators. Yay, I was one of those. We did that. Then it was our turn. Are we out there proving that it could be done? Nainoa already did it. All right. So after that, it's about reconnecting. Reconnecting with our roots, reconnecting with our whanau that we left behind when we came down here following the kuaka. Woohoo! Yeah, that's right. I was out on the ocean and saw an ocean full of kuaka flying, flying towards Norfolk Island and Vanuatu. In the middle, I was uh, halfway to Norfolk Island and all these kuaka flew straight over the top of me. You understand what that means? Lots of energy. They have to stop and feed and then carry on. <laughs> I had to do it like that. Whereas the albatross, he goes <laughs> and doesn't need that high energy. So his uh, requirement for food intake is not as high. Anyway, I just had to say that. Um, but, you know, all of those signs are out there and that's the things that we see. Now it's transferring that, reconnecting now into another connection, which is back to our original route, which is the moana and safeguarding uh, not just the ocean, but ourselves. So that's the purpose of, uh, of, uh, of, I suppose, the voyaging community today, because we're all involved in environmental issues to do with, uh, I suppose, preserving the ocean. Hey, nā reira, kā tira te kōrero. O tira e tika ana, nā mihi, nā mihi, nā mihi. Uh, we will take one question, <laughs> and then um, don't forget you're standing in the way of morning tea again. It's, it's lunch now, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions. Two questions. We have to apologise to Alex. <coughs> oh, yeah, you have to. No, no, no. Yes, I did a 10 year navigation, um, a certain navigation, um, before the days of GPS. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on the reversing um, trade wind patterns, which happens every now and then, between El uh, Nino and El Nino. Ah, okay, so, so the, the things I know about, about El Nino is, uh, is, uh, is it's the circulation of, uh, of uh, I suppose, the atmospheric conditions. So, so what you have is you have, you have the currents uh, that come along the southern, southern um, ocean and you've got the Humboldt that goes up the South American um, continent and then it comes back down through uh, the equatorial areas and then moves back down and then comes down uh, um, on the east coast of Aotearoa and then joins back up with that deep ocean current again. And so that whole circulation uh, is, uh, is uh, pretty much the life of, uh, of, uh, of the planet. It's all, it all revolves in, in, uh, in the necessity for those waters to be able to flow in the ways they do. And that's got to do, I suppose, with the rotation of the planet. So what you end up having with, a, with, an, with an El Nino is that you have the warm currents, they build up and they push towards this side of the Pacific. And so what uh, we, had, uh, we had the biggest El Nino ever recorded about three, four years ago, I think. I can't remember. Anyway, so all of that hot wind comes over here and we end up with drought and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and it's, but it's the warm currents that actually, that actually bring those. So one of the things that, uh, that I've noticed with, because um, with, uh, I studied the weather, is that um, when the warm currents um, are doing partic uh, different things, then uh, you, you can actually see uh, the changes in the weather that, uh, that happens around those, those warm currents. Like last year, as an uh, no, when did we do um, Wellington? Was it last year? Yeah, it was last year, sorry, early last year. We had, um, we were, January, we were preparing to sail down to Wellington uh, for the Festival of New Zealand or something, and we were bringing all our waka down there. So, I had to go to Waitangi, couldn't get there because the cyclone came down. And the cyclone came down and I'm going, 
and I'm and I'm looking at my weather charts and I'm saying to everyone, that one's gonna come down the west coast. And they says, but it's going east. And I says, yeah, but the warm waters are coming down the west coast. And then it, it went like this, and then it came down, and then it went back, and then it came down the west coast. Because cyclones need fuel. And the warm ocean temperatures are part of that fuel that they need to keep themselves raging. And so that cyclone came down, down, down our west coast and, and, and it actually died in the Tasman. And then we were in Auckland, so we couldn't get to Waitangi, so we ended up on Great Barrier Island. So then we, when we came out, we went down and we had two more cyclones come down and almost uh, one after the other. And uh, the first one, we ended up stopping in Napier. Uh, and then the third one, we, were, uh, we, 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 we thought about sailing down to Wellington and we went down to, to try and get into Wellington before the third one came through. And what happened was we got down the bottom before it, before it had come down and the winds were northerly and we couldn't get into Wellington. So we ended up going back to Napier. And that cyclone came down, went, came in, in, and came through uh, Cook Strait and then out into the, into the Pacific from there down towards uh, um, Chatham Islands. What, what I'm saying is, is, is that, was, that was, I believe, caused by uh, 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 an El Nino system that happened a couple of years earlier because what happened was all those expected uh, things that, that, uh, that, that you would expect that an El Nino like that would cause in the same year that it, uh, that it was the biggest and we got rain that year. We didn't get drought. We got rain. And then what happened was I believe, I believe that, that the effects of that El Nino didn't act, uh, actually built up over, over two years. And we've come out of it now because this, uh, the, um, this summer that we've just gone through uh, was a normal summer, a fairly normal summer. So when you, when you, when you study what the weather's doing, you've got to have a long-term view of, um, of what it's doing to have, a, a really, uh, to, to have an accurate picture of what you need to keep your canoe safe. And so that's why I've, uh, I've, uh, you know, I, I went, I went to Auckland University for a couple of years. Realised it wasn't for me. Joined the army, uh, and um, <laughs> and, uh, but I wish I had stayed now because you know uh, uh, my uh, uh, my study habits are a bit haphazard. <clears throat> <laughs> Worth is heard from the best, really. Mahitarai waka ehemi tenapu. Building waka, a craft, a profession. Jack, celestial navigator. And I think we've heard from the best. Tato maho mate, whakitati.